Uh, well, I, I don't want to say that we've left the best for last, because that would be unfair to our other very fine panellists, but we did think that uh, you'd all come back for more if we uh, kept uh, Rico and Biman Prasad at the end. Uh, so we're going to move on now uh, to uh, Solomon Islands and Fiji. And uh, our final two speakers are uh, Rico and Biman Prasad. Rico is the Minister of Finance and Treasury in Solomon Islands. Uh, before that, he was uh, with the World Bank. And before that, for a long time, he was governor of the Central Bank in Solomon's. And uh, Professor Biman Prasad is um, one of the leading uh, economists uh, in and for the region and is uh, at the University of South Pacific in Fiji and uh, also uh, affiliated with uh, the Griffith University. And uh, we're also uh, fortunate to have Biman visit us from time to time. So uh, we're going to have uh, Rick first and then uh, Biman as our final speaker. So over to you, Rick. Thank you, uh, Steve, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. <clears throat> My, um, I'm a politician now, but I'm a bit too uh, obsessed with the economy, of Islands economy, so my uh, presentation will be biased towards the economy. Uh, but let me uh, uh, say two points um, uh, first. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, some of the numbers that I will be referring to or I might be talking about are over a very short period of time, so in terms of series, it's not enough. Secondly, <clears throat> Uh, as, as most of you would know, Solomon Islands economy had enjoyed high growth rates, but this is considering the fact that um, uh, not too long ago we had a very low base. So, you know, high growth rates, but coming from a very low. So, Solomon Islands uh, growth rates has uh, averaged uh, over the last past few years uh, 8%. In fact, last year uh, over 10.5% uh, was recorded. Uh, uh, the main driver for this has, all, has been uh, the export sector, uh, both in terms of volumes and value, uh, vol uh, values uh, uh, for primary production in forestry, and minerals is uh, now contributing, plus uh, our mainstay in terms of agriculture. Inflation uh, has been uh, uh, under control. It has shown uh, um, its head up uh, last year. Uh, um, over 10%. Uh, it has now um, pointed downwards again, thank goodness, and um, I think we would like to uh, keep it there. It's uh, below 6% uh, using the three-month uh, moving average that the central bank publishes. On the external front, uh, the balance of payments uh, continue to show strong uh, trends as well. Again, as I was saying uh, before, that has been uh, coming from the, uh, the trade sector, mainly export sector, which uh, has dominated economic activity. Uh, in fact, in the first half of this year, um, total exports rose by more than 30% compared to uh, imports, which uh, uh, rose by only 19%. Um, while logs uh, re remain uh, the dominant uh, contributor to our foreign exchange, um, I think the other fact uh, uh, that we are now seeing happening is that um, in terms of log exports uh, compared to um, total exports, uh, their contribution has fallen to 45%, while minerals uh, export uh, has increased to 29% of total exports. The external reserves uh, continue to be uh, very uh, uh, healthy. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, they're recording uh, uh, over $3.5 million, uh, which is equivalent to more than 10 months of imports cover. This is compared when I was at the central bank uh, some 50, uh, probably more than 10 years ago. We were talking about days, uh, not even weeks. Um, the medium-term forecast uh, would indicate that the next uh, few years, however, uh, GDP is uh, expected to f uh, fall, uh, fall. Uh, uh, figures that uh, the central bank has uh, published indicate that uh, GDP would uh, uh, grow, uh, would decline significantly compared to 2011 levels to around 4 to 5% growth uh, this year. 
Now, in terms of policy actions, um, uh, the government has recognized this not so good picture. The first policy decision the government has taken is that uh, beginning last year, um, the government has set itself not to spend more than it earns. So uh, last year, a small budget uh, uh, surplus. This year, we're working on a, a balanced budget. Uh, also, we've got to look for alternative sources of growth. Uh, we remain in the primary sector um, and uh, the sectors that uh, we believe uh, will provide an alternative uh, agriculture, uh, fisheries, minerals, and tourism. In fact, uh, in support of these uh, uh, um, new sources of, uh, of growth, the government in uh, last year's budget, including this year's budget, has commi committed significant uh, allocations to infrastructure and public sector uh, uh, investment in transportation, uh, utilities, the telecommunication, and other services in support of this policy uh, action. In terms of other uh, actions that um, the government is pursuing, uh, very much on the tax, uh, on the uh, reforms, um, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of uh, things that we are doing, but I'll just mention a few. Uh, tax reforms, uh, the government is improving the tax system to help shape uh, business climate and also set out priorities for the infrastructure reform. Uh, we are uh, uh, um, uh, fairly advanced in um, designing a new mining tax re regime uh, that is uh, to encourage mining activity while at the same time ensuring that um, uh, we have a fair return to Solomon Islands uh, um, uh, economy. Uh, and in a complementary reform, uh, Solomon Islands is also adopting the EITI uh, initiative, which uh, promotes transparency and accountability in, in extractive uh, industries. Uh, also, last year, uh, to, uh, to, to decrease the tax burden um, on the private sector, and at the same time, uh, in an effort to increase disposable income, in the hope that it will increase saving as well as uh, uh, investment, the tax um, uh, 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 tax uh, threshold was uh, was increased. In terms of our SOE reforms uh, program, uh, there has been also good progress. Um, the implementation of the SOE um, Act in uh, of 2007 is uh, helping many of these uh, <clears throat> public entities uh, on their governance as well as to strengthen their uh, uh, balance sheets. Uh, we have been uh, taking advantage of significant uh, donor assistance um, uh, with uh, specific actions in uh, some of the entities, um, uh, for example, with the Water and the Electricity Authority. Uh, there's a lot of work that has happened with assistance, technical, both technical and financial assistance, through the World Bank, uh, OSAID, and JICA to commercialize the operations of these two entities. Um, and um, uh, uh, in, um, well, two months ago, uh, the debt situation uh, between these two entities, what they were doing was they were borrowing from each other, or, well, not paying each other, and so it was affecting their balance sheets. So um, uh, with the help of this, uh, of OSAID and um, uh, the, the World Bank, the government uh, has brokered a, a deal with these two entities, which has now put their debts, as it were, behind them, and that has strengthened their balance sheet. The other reform uh, that uh, has, uh, has been happening, uh, uh, taking a positive uh, uh, look now, is uh, on the debt management. Um, the, the debt situation has, um, our debt ratio has fallen now to 19% uh, of, um, uh, um, uh, compared to what it was uh, uh, previously. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, ratio to debt servicing uh, domest uh, from uh, uh, to co uh, domestically sourced revenues, it's around 4%. That's a very big positive indeed. In, in terms of uh, budget reforms, um, 
we are implementing a new budget system that uh, has now led to improved expenditure controls, which in turn is leading to uh, better payroll spending, uh, which means that um, uh, when payment vouchers come to the Treasury, if it's not recognized in a budget line item, it, is, it just gets rejected automatically. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, the, the only other thing I'd like to mention is um, uh, uh, just uh, a few months ago, we, uh, in the fishery sector, we, uh, the government take, took a policy change in terms of um, um, long line fishing, uh, and that policy uh, 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 action was that no long line fishing, uh, uh, well, all fishing um, uh, catch from long liners have to be processed in some islands. So what that made was everybody that uh, used to catch fish in some islands uh, by long line uh, uh, methods um, either don't come uh, or if they are going to continue have to sell uh, their fish to local uh, companies in order to be processed. Finally, uh, I'd like to uh, just mention that uh, in 2009, 2010, uh, as is uh, the case in most of our Pacific Island countries, uh, the Solomon Islands took a, a very decisive action uh, to uh, liberalize the telecommunication sector, which has led to quite um, so a significant um, uh, um, uh, results. Now, um, I think 75% of Solomon Islands population is accessible to, to phones compared to like less than 10% five years ago. And uh, um, um, uh, prices have also fallen significantly. That's a very big plus on the economy. And uh, perhaps just in conclusion, I'd like to just to say that um, this is a very quick run on our, our reforms. And like others have said already, um, the, re the reform program can go on forever. But the other thing that uh, we, have, we are finding out is that it can be very, very exhaustive. And with a lean uh, public service like we have in Solomon Islands, which is not very uh, experienced, it can, uh, it, can be, it can demand a lot of the public service, uh, even on ministers. So sometimes we have very difficult uh, debates, uh, put mildly. Uh, with our friends on, from OSAID and ADB and World Bank when they come to visit us. Because the very thing that makes all these people come to us is these reforms. So uh, you deal with one team, go out, and then another team comes in, and you just end up meeting people. <laughs> anyway, I think that's part of reforms. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rick, and I think it's interesting to know just how much reform is going on in the Solomons. Let's uh, go on to our very last speaker. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what I, um, uh, this is not going to be a complete uh, Fiji update. Um, uh, I'll try and give you a quick story. Um, A quick story of what has happened in Fiji in the last 25 years, or let, let me, or should I say, in the last 42 years, because um, <laughs> we, we um, uh, achieved independence in 1970. Uh, 14th May 2012, we completed 25 years um, of, of um, the first uh, coup in 1987. And, and what I uh, really want to um, uh, tell you from this little story is the link between uh, political instability and uh, Fiji's economic performance. Uh, it is, uh, of course, well known uh, that uh, the relationship between uh, political instability or political credibility uh, and economic uh, performance uh, uh, is, is well established empirically uh, in, in many of the countries uh, uh, around the world. Uh, and, and Fiji's uh, poor economic growth um, in the last 25 years uh, can be largely explained 
by the political instability, uh, or should I say, the impact of the military coups uh, uh, in Fiji. If you look at the um, average growth um, in the 1970s, but soon after independence, right up to uh, the early 1980s, the average growth was about 5.5%. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, we went down to 1.9%. And again, in the 1990s, the impact of the 1987 coup uh, was a significant uh, factor. Uh, then in the 1990s, when we were talking about a constitutional process after five years of uh, interim government, after 1987, and the, and the promulgation of the 1990 constitution, although it was a very controversial constitution, leveled as a, as a racist constitution, the fact that we were able to get a parliament uh, convened and a government formed uh, under that constitution in 1992 provided some sort of uh, uh, stability and, and the dialogue that started about a new constitution in 1994 uh, allowed uh, a reasonable growth in the 1990s. Uh, and again, uh, when we came to the 2000, uh, between 1994, uh, and I'll show you some other graphs later on, between 1994 and 1999, because of the political dialogue and the finalization of the 1997 constitution, there was a lot of confidence in, in the political process, and, and I think that allowed uh, the country to, to uh, increase its investment. And in fact, the economic growth in, in 1999 uh, averaged about 9%. And that was a legacy of the political dialogue that started in 1994 and carried on until the election uh, in 1999. Again, we had a break, uh, 2000 coup, and in the two, 2000s, uh, we had uh, a very low uh, average growth of 0.8 percent. Average in the last uh, uh, average in the last five years. Stephen, I. Yeah, this one on the side. On the side. Okay. okay. I just want to um, um, then uh, quickly uh, compare Fiji with Mauritius. And I have a paper which is uh, already on, uh, on the uh, Development Policy Center uh, website as a discussion paper where I've looked at uh, why Fiji is not the Mauritius of the Pacific. And many people have asked me in the past, you know, they've, they've said, why do you compare Fiji with Mauritius? Mauritius is very different. In fact, on, on a lot of indicators, it is not. It is very similar to, to Fiji. It's a very plural society, multi-religious, multi-ethnic society. Uh, and, and, uh, and the fact that Fiji and Mauritius, uh, at, at a point uh, in, around 1985, 1986, uh, had very, very similar uh, development indicators, uh, suggest that, that the comparison between Mauritius and Fiji uh, makes sense. And let me just show you three uh, graphs very, very quickly. Uh, this is um, uh, GDP growth uh, uh, in a comparison between Fiji and Mauritius. Uh, but look at, look at this, this graph and the next one that I'm going to show. If you look at uh, what the situation was around 1985, 1986, in fact, around 1985, 1986, Fiji's development indicators were better than Mauritius. And, and on all uh, indicators, Fiji was poised for better economic growth uh, than Mauritius. But look what happened after the 87 coup, um, and, and look what happened after 1994, when the political dialogue after the implementation of the 1994, uh, sorry, 1990 constitution uh, started. In fact, between 1994 and right up to uh, 2000, there was a lot of confidence, political stability, and, and the expectation that political institutions uh, would be very inclusive and that, and that there would be uh, an expectation of a better future uh, led uh, to a lot of confidence and, and indicators like national savings uh, were on the rise between 1994 and 2000. Uh, look at the um, uh, investment uh, graph. 
again, a very clear trend around 1986, uh, 87, uh, Mauritius and Fiji were somewhat on a, on a, on a, uh, on a similar uh, situation. But soon after 1987, and you can follow the trend again, right up to 1994 when political dialogue started, when a, the new constitution was adopted in 1997, and the election in 1999, uh, again, uh, as a result of the coup, uh, and you look at what happened after 2006 as well. Just uh, very quickly, uh, some indicators in the last 10 years, because uh, it is important for us to understand what has happened over the last 10 years after the 2000 coup. Uh, you can see that the trend uh, is very, very uh, clear. Uh, if you look at national debt, uh, again, uh, the trend is an increasing one, uh, and uh, we haven't uh, made any progress there. Uh, sugar production, uh, again, uh, you look at what has happened in the last 10 years, uh, it's on the decline. And in fact, the, the, the 2006 coup uh, damaged the industry further because the European Union funding of about 300 million euro, amounting to about 600 uh, million Fijian, was really intended for the restructure of the sugar industry around 2006, 2007. And as a result of the 2006 coup, we lost that uh, funding and, and we've lost about five years plus that funding, and, and uh, the sugar industry is really in a, in a bad shape. Uh, military expenditure, on the other hand, uh, has continued to rise, and uh, that's expected. Um, the military uh, is very much uh, part of the uh, uh, governance structure in Fiji at the moment, and um, that, that's something that, that is very, very clear. Uh, uh, let me just uh, come back very quickly to this idea of confidence. Uh, what has happened in the last uh, five years, the government has tried many attempts to increase the level of private sector investment. There's been a lot of incentives, and the trend is very similar. After 87, we had tax holidays, we had tax incentives. After 2000, we went through the same process again. And after 2006, we again uh, talked about various kinds of tax incentives. But that has not resulted uh, in, in a significant uh, private sector uh, investment. In fact, uh, in the last uh, five years, the average private sector investment uh, has been about 2% of GDP. The Reserve Bank of Fiji uh, estimate is 4%. Even if you take the average of the two, uh, it's almost uh, uh, 3%. Uh, and that's a very, very low um, uh, low. Uh, level of private sector investment. Foreign investment uh, has also been very, very low. And one of the things that, uh, that uh, the government in Fiji seems not to have understood, uh, and perhaps uh, from, from the Australian side uh, too, you know, that particular issue about investment has not been understood because the government has been talking about uh, uh, looking north, uh, uh, trying to attract investment from uh, beyond Australia and New Zealand uh, but they didn't realize that, that a lot of the private sector investment, a lot of the foreign investment, uh, normally go through Australia, New Zealand, and Sydney, Melbourne. Uh, it's still very, very important. Uh, and, and the fact that uh, the tension we've had with, with Australia and New Zealand in the last five years uh, has uh, quite uh, badly affected the level of private sector investment. And the confidence of investors from these countries and beyond uh, has been significantly damaged uh, as a result of what has happened in the last five years. Within the country, again, I think there is a, a, a large confi confidence deficit. Uh, the expectation of what happens in the future determines what people do uh, today. And, and, and I think uh, despite the, the efforts of the uh, government, uh, the level of confidence within the domestic uh, investors has not uh, increased, and in fact, the trend has been the opposite. Many of the uh, domestic investors uh, have have chosen to invest uh, in other Pacific Island countries and also in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, consumers uh, are, are, have, have lost confidence as well. Uh, consumer spending um, has has been uh, declining. Uh, the budget uh, that was put forward um, uh, last. Um, uh, last year was supposed to be a bold budget. You know, they reduced the company tax, they reduced the personal income tax, 
uh, hoping that that will spare confidence, that will spare spending in the economy, and we have yet to uh, see that. Uh, so I, I think, um, in, in conclusion, uh, what we can say uh, that there is a very, very clear relationship between what happened to politics in Fiji and the role of the military and the coups in Fiji and the political instability that, that, that arose as a result of those coups has affected directly the economic performance of Fiji. And, and we don't need uh, fancy econometrics to prove that. I think it's, it's very, very clear uh, that, that the political instability has been the key uh, issue. Uh, let me just say one, uh, one quick, uh, make one more quick point. And that is that the, the Benimarama government um, did undertake uh, some reforms. And I think Ron once talked about cleaning up the economy. So there has been some cleaning up of the economy, uh, deregulation of the telecommunication sector. Uh, and, and today, I think Fiji is at a very critical juncture. The constitutional process itself, however flawed it might be at the moment, provides some opportunity and, and it's, it's, going to, it's likely to generate some confidence in the uh, economy and in the country. And if we follow the path uh, and if we do have an election in 2014, I think we would have laid down a good foundation for growth beyond 2014. Thank you very much.